Good evening and uh, welcome to tonight's program uh, in, in uh, recognition of World TB Day, which is tomorrow, March 24th, which is the anniversary of the discovery by uh, Koch of the tubercle bacillus, mycobacterium tuberculosis, the cause of tuberculosis. And uh, every year the Public Health Museum has a program and this year the program is dedicated to tuberculosis in children. And uh, it is a great pleasure to be joined this evening by Dr. Vandana Madhavan, who is a pediatric infectious disease specialist at the Massachusetts General Hospital and the clinical director of the pediatric ID service there. Uh, and she also is the physician at the North Shore Pulmonary TB uh, Clinic in, at uh, uh, Salem Hospital, North Shore Medical Center. Uh, Dr. Madhavan uh, attended Harvard College and the University of Virginia Medical School, did a residency at the Massachusetts General Hospital uh, and fellowships at uh, Children's Hospital and in Health Services Research. Uh, and um, she is very active at the Mass General in the training of students, residents, and fellows. So uh, it, it's, it's great. Great to have her here for this program. And I'm going to be talking about the uh, early years. Uh, you know, tuberculosis has been around for a long time, but uh, in the 19th century was particularly uh, a century of tuberculosis. And uh, I'm going to be talking about tuberculosis in children, essentially prior to World War II, mostly between 1890 and 1930. And this is because we have a, a trove of material related to TB in children at the Public Health Museum that uh, is just coming to light. And uh, I, I would like to share that with you. And then Dr. Madhavan will be talking about tuberculosis as it exists today. So what we were talking about is uh, TB in children, a uh, century of progress, but a global threat. And uh, I'm gonna be doing that, the progress part at the beginning, uh, and then Dr. Madhavan will be following. I just wanna remind people that the Public Health Museum has an extensive, pro extensive number of programs for public uh, national public health week. And uh, you, can't, you can't really, get it all here, but this just points you to the website where this is now posted for uh, registrations and for information about the various programs uh, that will be occurring. So let, let's get started with tuberculosis in children in the early 20th century. In the 19th century, uh, most people who died, died of an infectious disease. Uh, up to 60% of everyone who died, died of infection. And about half of those infections was, were tuberculosis. Tuberculosis was the number one cause of death. Now, I didn't say the number one infectious disease cause of death. It was literally the number one cause of death uh, in the United States and in over uh, large parts of the world. And, and the 19th century was particularly uh, hard hit by TB, probably because people were dying less of other things and population was growing and uh, average population age was uh, going down. So uh, the 19th century was really sort of, life was colored by the threat of tuberculosis illness. And in those days, once you had tuberculosis, you were, you, were, you had tuberculosis and you, you weren't going to get better. You weren't going to uh, get cured, but you could get better, actually. You could go into remission. You could um, arrest the process of active disease and survive longer. But pretty much everyone with tuberculosis would eventually succumb to it. So uh, it, was, it was a very bad uh, thing. And children were susceptible to TB and susceptible to severe TB 
and susceptible to mortality. And a good example of this is the Lincoln family, uh, you know, essentially a middle class family from Illinois uh, who had four sons and they lost all three of the four sons to infection, two of them to tuberculosis uh, before the age of 18. So, uh, you know, this, this was typical of families across the board uh, and was perhaps more prevalent in people of lower socioeconomic status. So infectious disease, TB in particular, was a major cause of death uh, in children. Now, it was, you know, in adults, it was the number one cause of death. Uh, in children, it didn't reach probably number one in most ages, perhaps by teenagers, yes. But uh, for younger children, there were so many other things that could lead to their death that uh, TB was among the causes and not necessarily the number one. And child mortality was substantial in the 19th century. And it was at the end of the 19th century with the application of public health interventions that child mortality came down. But uh, for all of human history up until the early 19th century, uh, approximately 46% of all children born died before the age of five. That's an incredible statistic. And uh, even, even in uh, the uh, most uh, low socioeconomic uh, circumstances in, in uh, lower, lower socioeconomic countries, uh, it, it's, not, it's still bad, but it's come down considerably, especially in the last 20 to 40 years uh, uh, and uh, is no longer at that rate. So that's, that's what it was like uh, at the beginning of the 19th century. And if you look at children at Tewksbury Hospital, uh, and there were a number of children at Tewksbury Hospital, there were, there were foundlings, there were children born there who couldn't be taken care of. There were children brought there. There were children who came there because they were orphans. Uh, there were a lot of children. Uh, at Tewksbury Almshouse, Tewksbury Hospital. If you look at them by age group, you can see in the red, the growing proportion of tuberculosis. But even in the infants, tuberculosis was among the top five causes of death uh, with really uh, debility, failure to thrive, malnutrition uh, leading the way. So what in the 19th century, the answer to tuberculosis, especially prior to uh, Cook and the discovery of the tubercle bacillus at a time when most people who thought about it, the experts in the field, thought that TB was either a hereditary disease, because after all, it ran in families, or it was due to environmental conditions, especially um, uh, cold, damp, low uh, elevation areas, uh, sort of that miasma uh, idea that that was a cause of tuberculosis. And the best that they could come up with was putting people in environments, uh, usually at high altitudes uh, with uh, exposure to cold, fresh air, good nutrition, uh, a lot of milk and cheese and, and, and carbohydrates and fats, and just try to overcome uh, tuberculosis with uh, measures that sort of increased general health and hopefully uh, fighting off and arresting active TB. So sanatoria were the first intervention. And then Koch discovers the tubercle bacillus. So now there's an explanation for TB that is not environmental, that is not hereditary. Uh, and uh, uh, evidence that it's transmissible. So now the sanatoria take on a different uh, meaning in terms of not just helping people get stronger to fight off TB, but also to reduce transmission by isolating people and then attempting to arrest their active disease. And then the big next big advance was the uh, discovery by Rankin of, of x-rays, which allows you to uh, visualize pulmonary TB uh, as the, the most prominent. Now, TB 
can affect any organ in the body, but it's most prominent in the lungs. And that's how most transmission occurs by people coughing up TB bacilli. And then back in 1890, Koch invented tuberculin. He thought he had a treatment, a cure for TB, like a, a vaccine to promote uh, immunity, but it didn't work. But it did come in handy for skin testing. And in 1906, von Perquet, uh, developed a skin test so that you could look at hypersensitivity to TB, which correlated infection, having the organism infecting your body body with the risk of active TB thereafter. Uh, and then the final thing I want to mention in this context of what was going on in the 1890s to 1930 was in 1921, uh, BCG vaccine. Uh, which is still used worldwide, and, and Dr. Madhavan will, will be talking about that and uh, why, uh, why it's used and why we don't use it. But it, it, it was an advance in terms of pediatric TB because the one thing it did was prevent severe disease in very young children. And then uh, after World War II, streptomycin, PAS, uh, isoniazid, all the drugs we still used to treat TB and other drugs came along. And now TB was curable. So TB is transmitted when somebody with pulmonary TB coughs out the organisms, the droplets dry in the air, people inhale those droplets, they get into the alveoli of the lung, they get picked up by cells that eat them up and those cells then go to the lymph nodes in the chest uh, and uh, so-called primary TB in children is exactly that. It's the infection of those lymph nodes, which, which are represented here. Uh, and then the organisms get into the bloodstream and they literally go everywhere in the body. So you can have, you can have TB in the bone, you can have TB in the brain, you can have TB in the kidneys, you can have TB in the gut. You can have TB everywhere in the body, but it really likes the tops of the lung and that's where you see TB most often, but in young children it can be disseminated TB or they can get TB meningitis. And that is a, a very severe consequence of infection. And then the other important way TB was transmitted before there was pasteurized milk generally used uh, and before herds of dairy cows were uh, screened for tuberculosis and they were culled if they had TB. Uh, milk was a source of TB. And uh, I went through a number of uh, sort of developments in TB, and you can see that almost regardless of those developments, there was a decrease in TB starting at the beginning of the 20th century. And a lot of that had to do with an understanding of the infectious nature. And TB became reportable in uh, Massachusetts uh, in in 1910, prior to that, it wasn't considered uh, a, a disease dangerous to the public health and needing reporting. It was obviously dangerous to the public health, but it didn't need reporting. And then it was added to the list and we started to get more complete reporting of tuberculosis. And you can see with the interventions I talked about, it, there was an impact on, on uh, mortality from tuberculosis over time, and especially uh, uh, after the limitation of numbers of people infected. Uh, the, so the, the first uh, sanatorium in, in Massachusetts was in Sharon, Massachusetts, and it was the first sanatorium at sea level. And that, would, that it was a proof of concept that you didn't need to have a sanatorium on a mountain. We don't have I guess in Western Massachusetts, we have mountains that would be considered high enough, but uh, started by Vincent Y. Bodich in 1890, the Sharon Sanatorium demonstrated the effectiveness of sanatorium care at lower elevation. Uh, and like all sanatoria, it really focused on people getting fresh air during the day and then at night sleeping basically uh, under the elements uh, in summer and winter. Uh, as, as a measure that seemed to help people. And I think there is, there is some evidence that it, actually, that it actually worked. And then the first state sanitarium in the United States was in 
was in Rutland. Now, there were sanitariums before this, as I, as I showed you, the Trudeau sanitarium in particular, but they were all private. So government was coming into the business uh, of creating sanatoria for TB patients, both to provide the treatment that was available at the time and also to isolate people with TB to have an impact at a population level in terms of transmission. So the Rutland Sanitarium ultimately was a very big operation uh, and uh, it uh, took care of a large number of people starting in 1898. And, and then uh, around the same time, the state hospitals, the mental health hospitals, the almshouses like the Tewksbury Hospital uh, and uh, uh, other state facilities started creating units for treatment of TB, primarily because they were getting a lot of people with TB. And you know, as I said, prior to that, it wasn't really recognized as infectious and there wasn't a lot of intention towards uh, keeping people isolated. Uh, at Tewksbury was the uh, Bancroft building, which is no longer there. And outdoors, they had a pavilion where people could sleep outdoors uh, in addition to the indoor accommodations in the Bancroft building. And uh, Danvers State Hospital also around the same time created facilities for people with active TB to treat them. Uh, and Massachusetts was actually recognized at the, at the uh, International Congress on TB in 1908 as having very progressive measures. In 1902, uh, Boston opened the Mattapan Consumptives Hospital uh, and uh, started to provide uh, sanatorium care for people in the city of Boston. Uh, and many other communities started to provide, provide care. And they all had this characteristic outdoor pavilion. Many of them had day camps. So they would actually bring people who were living at home in for food and exercise and fresh air and all of the things they may not have been getting uh, in tenement environments or uh, in the workplace uh, to help them with TB. And there were a lot of free facilities, charitable institutions, some of which had nominal charges, some like the Free Home for Consumptives in Dorchester uh, were, were free for people. Uh, and around 1905, 1906, there was a, a mobilization in Massachusetts that was led by the medical society and its districts. And each district decided to take on TB. And associations were created in uh, cities and towns across, across the state, starting in 1905, but then continuing 1906, seven and, and beyond. So that each city and town had an association for the relief and control of tuberculosis. And um, there were, there was even in 1906, a, a TB exhibition that drew 26,000 people trying to educate people about TB. And in, in 1906, there was a commission uh, and they recommended making it reportable, keeping good records, um, application of disinfection and no spitting. No spitting was a big deal. Uh, formation of anti-TB associations at the local level and hospitals for advanced cases. Uh, and in fact, in, in 1906, there was legislation based on those recommendations to prohibit expectoration and create three hospitals. Uh, at the same time, other organizations like the Federation of the Women's Club were starting day camps for TB, uh, initially for adults, but then uh, starting around this time, uh, day camps for children, especially during the summer when school was out. I just want to say spitting per se does not transmit TB, but it, you know people were just focused on, on spitting because the bug was in the saliva, but it was the coughing, sneezing, breathing that transmits the TB. Uh, so the state went ahead and built three sanatoria, one uh, in North Reading, which was the first to open. Uh, and was initially called the Martins Brook uh, Sanatorium and became the North Reading Sanatorium 
ultimately, and again, the open shack structure. They were basing the, their sanatorium models on the European models that Bramer uh, Sanatorium I showed you to begin with, uh, and uh, you know, sort of like Thomas Mann's Magic Mountain type facility. Uh, and this is a, a picture of that facility. It's actually, I figured out it's looking right around there. Uh, and how the people would stay. You can see the snow on the ground and they're sitting outdoors wrapped up considerably of breathing that brisk cold air. Uh, and then Lakeville and West, Westfield State Sanatoria uh, opened uh, in, uh, 1900, uh, in 1910. 1909 was North Reading and then the next year the two others that were recommended open. And these grew ex to be very extensive facilities, uh, in many cases uh, with farming and self-supporting and, and uh, people, were, uh, people were treated there and also they were isolated there. Uh, and, and many other facilities opened up at this time as well, the Good Samaritan Hospital, which ultimately became part of Children's Hospital, uh, had a, had summer and winter camps. Uh, it, it was a general hospital, but it took care of TB as well. Same with the Children's Hospital uh, uh, unit in Wellesley Hills, which was a, a, a general unit, but you can see it was designed to also be able to care for uh, people with tuberculosis with extensive ventilation. Uh, Cambridge had a day camp and had a sanatorium. Uh, and, and there was a lot of attention to workplace and occupational health and the role of TB in the workplace and trying to get workplaces to look more ideal than typical. Uh, and, and the, you know, that typical workplace was kind of messy, but that doesn't necessarily mean, uh, except for the fact it doesn't look like it was well ventilated, that it, particularly from a TB standpoint, that it would have been that much worse. Uh, and again, these TB associations also uh, really got into providing services, including services and day camps for children. Uh, and in 1912, the United States created the first, actually the first agency in the world focused solely on children. And uh, if you go back into the 19th century, uh, so many children died of so many infections, primarily, but other for, from other causes as well, you know, people took it for granted that that's what happened. And finally, at the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, it was recognized that something could be done about this. Uh, and there was a lot more attention, uh, including the development of this federal agency in, 19, in 1912. And, and people started to recognize that children were particularly at risk for TB uh, and uh, exposure to TB because of infected adults around them. Not, not a major source of transmission, but uh, I, I, I sort of uh, at risk from the environmental exposures. And, and as a result of the Framingham Demonstration Project, which went from 1917 um, to 1923, 24, I don't remember the end, but uh, uh, this was a, a TB project where they screened the entire town of Framingham for tuberculosis and found a lot of unidentified uh, to undiagnosed tuberculosis. Uh, and they found that 33% of the kids were skin test positive. They had TB infection, were at risk of developing active disease in their lifetime uh, and really brought attention uh, to uh, childhood TB uh, and there were TB, or there were children's tests. Now, these camps didn't just take kids who had a positive skin test and TB. They took kids who were at risk because there was potential TB exposure. They were at risk because they were malnourished and they gave them, gave them a healthy environment, at least for the summer when they were out of school. Fresh air and good food, rest and play for the undernourished children. Uh, and this again is in framing camp. And, and more and more, the state TB sanatoriums, 
sanatoria. You know, there's this question, is it sanitarium, sanatorium, sanitarium? Is it? And they're all interchangeable, it turns out, although some people like to make fine distinctions. But anyway, in, in North Reading, they took more and more children. Uh, and by 1926, they became a totally a pediatric tuberculosis facility. So it gives you a sense of the numbers uh, in, that, in that period. And you can see cold was very much a part of their environment as well. These kids were bundled up all the time because breathing the cold air was felt to be healthy. Uh, and again, these, the, now there were sanatoria that were uh, not necessarily in the mountains as the early as the early version. And then in 1921, the Shepherd Towner Act passed. It was bipartisan and it basically paid the states to take care of kids. Uh, and uh, it was very progressive, but the states could, you know, it was sort of like the uh, Affordable Care Act. The states could determine how much they were gonna take. And states like Massachusetts said, no, no, we don't want this. This is socialism. We don't wanna take the money from the feds. Uh, so many states didn't take it, but the the states with the poorest population took it and it had a huge impact on maternal and child health. Uh, and health centers were established. And it was the major reason uh, for hiring large numbers of public health nurses in the 1920s. So a lot of a uh, public health nurse workforce was developed uh, in, this, in this program. Uh, the AMA was against it for that same socialism reason. And it was actually the reason the American Academy of Pediatrics was formed. They split off because uh, they were in favor of this. It, it actually sunset in 1929, but then the depression happened uh, and the Social Security Act, largely through the efforts of uh, Martha May Elliott had provisions for children, maternal and child health. And to this day, that, uh, that is supporting children, uh, uh, ch ch maternal and child health. Uh, and then uh, in these, uh, in Westfield Sanatorium, Henry Chadwick was the uh, med chief medical officer there and, and an expert in tuberculosis. And he started the study in 1924 of testing school children for TB using skin tests to see if they had TB infection and were at risk of um, uh, getting active TB. He also did chest x-rays looking for that primary tuberculosis, the lymph node disease. Uh, and he, he found substantial numbers of children uh, in later grades. So over time, these children were being exposed to TB and had unrecognized infection. And, and it led to, to a, a screening regimen and especially in older children uh, where the, the yield was great and, and attention to those children and, and attempting to prevent them um, from developing active disease by supportive methods. And then the Prendergast Preventorium was, was <coughs> a, a facility that was uh, started in 1911. And uh, it, it was a place uh, what, for men to go to while they were waiting to get into the city or state sanatorium uh, or, or men with arrested disease to sort of build themselves up. Uh, and then gradually they started having summer programs. Uh, and then in 1921, they became a pediatric facility. This idea of the preventorium, you would take those children, you were sending to summer camp, and now you would have programs essentially all year long for these kids uh, who had the problems I already alluded to. Uh, and then you tried to relieve them of strain, you know, they, and you gave them healthy diet and healthy environments. Uh, and these were mostly inner city children. So the Prendergast Preventorium became a, a very prominent uh, or, uh, facility uh, and, and, uh, for, and became a focus of, of care for children. And, and the museum has a scrapbook of, uh, of, uh, that somebody put together uh, around uh, probably not too long after 1921 when this started. Uh, and they had all kinds of activities for children. So it was kind of a, uh, a wonderful facility. Uh, and 
I just want to mention Christmas seals because I've been talking about the TV associations and Christmas seals started, I think, in 1906 or seven uh, in uh, Denmark. Uh, and then was adopted uh, in the United States. And the, the Red Cross would sell these, the TV Association would sell these um, to raise money for TV care. And a lot of these programs were supported by the Christmas seals. And you see this on, on many of the educational posters and so forth, and many of the uh, programs that were developed, especially for children. Uh, and these kids built this themselves. That's what they're very, very proud of there, uh, what they did. But you can see they were kept outside with minimal clothes to, to be exposed to fresh air. Uh, I don't know, you know, I can understand breathing fresh air, but I don't get the other part, but that's what they did. Uh, and then uh, after World War II, uh, there, there was renewed interest in doing Southern TB. The drugs became available. There was recognition that TB was still a problem that needed to be addressed. And a lot of things were done. A lot of TB programs were uh, uh, expanded and increased. The sanitoria were still there. Uh, and there was now a focus on convincing people that, that people that TB cases had to be found preferably before they were severely uh, symptomatic. Uh, and uh, they had to be managed in the ways that I was, was indicating. So that brings us to the post-war period. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Madhavan and we'll do questions. We'll do questions at the end. Uh, and uh, we can, you can put your questions in the chat or uh, at the end I can allow people uh, to do it. There's one thing I did forget to do. Um, and, and I was looking at everybody on this uh, who are attending, and, and most people know who I am, but I'm Aldi Maria. I'm the president of the Public Health Museum. Uh, and, uh, and and again, welcome. Let me turn it over to Dr. Madhavan. Okay, can everyone see my, my title slide? Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you, first of all, um, for the kind introduction and for that fascinating view. Um, when Dr. De Maria asked me to talk tonight, I was especially excited, not only because I love to talk about pediatric TB, but I remember reading biographies of Helen Keller and her teacher, Annie Sullivan. Um, the latter, along with her brother, um, were patients or residents at the Tewksbury Alms House. Um, in the middle of the 19th century. And so I remember reading about that. Um, and, you know, her, her younger brother um, died of uh, uh, positives, likely, you know, bony tuberculosis, et cetera. And so it brought up a lot of childhood memories of, of reading these biographies. So um, that was a fascinating, you know, discussion. I'm going to um, uh, skip ahead a, a, a few decades. Um, and I'm not going to focus so much on the what. Um, we will talk a little bit about um, uh, epidemiology, um, uh, where we are in terms of pediatric TB, but I, the question I want to keep coming back to is the why. Why is pediatric TB still something we need to think about, even though, as we've seen um, in you know the, the earliest slides um, in Dr. DeMaria's talk, um, tuberculosis mortality has decreased, uh, or overall childhood mortality has decreased, mortality from TB has decreased in the US. What are some particular challenges? Why is it still something we need to think about? Um, what are specific populations and how um, the specific challenges of tuberculosis in children and specifically tuberculosis in children in the US um, inform um, our policies and, and how we view uh, screening, testing, and treatment of tuberculosis. Um, I have no disclosures. Um, so I'm going to briefly review current pediatric TB epidemiology. Um, 
talk um, about the importance of pediatric TB as a personal and public health emergency. I'll keep coming back to uh, to this point. Um, talk a little bit about the BCG vaccine um, and then diagnostic challenges in pediatric TB. A very brief review of TB screening, testing, and treatment, um, but really coming back to the special pediatric challenges and considerations. And I really want to make sure we have enough time for questions, um, you know, at the end. Um, I know we have um, a lot of different um, attendees um, in the audience, some um, with more of a medical background, especially in, in tuberculosis. Um, much of this is not gonna be new, um, but I, I wanted to have like a, a slightly different focus. I'm, I'm always happy to answer questions at the end. So jumping right in, um, thinking about TB epidemiology, you know, where are we? And I think this is something, even though, yes, overall TB mortality is better, we have um, a vaccine that is good for some, um, some indications. Um, we have medications, um, we have newer second and third and, and later generation medications. Um, TB is still um, an enormous burden um, globally and relatively speaking still, um, still in the US as well. Um, looking at WHO um, data from 2020, um, looking at TB disease, um, looking at um, a global burden of nearly 8 million cases and that's um, a numerator out of a denominator of 1.7 billion with TB infection. And just very briefly, I, I didn't want to go into pathophysiology and, and go into that, but when I'm talking about TB infection, I'm talking about what you might be called TB or latent tuberculosis, or as I talked about it with my pediatric patients, sleeping tuberculosis. Um, and this is um, a, a patient with a positive skin test or a positive blood test who has been not only exposed to tuberculosis, but has developed infection, but is not yet symptomatic. Um, and so that's why we have such a huge burden of TB infection. And remembering this is a huge reservoir of people who might potentially develop TB disease and that becomes not just a personal health issue, but then a public health issue as well, um, uh, as, as a little teaser for what I'll talk about, you know, in children. So remembering that, you know, still seven point, you know, seven point eight, you know, million, nearly eight million, um, you know, cases um, um, of uh, 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 number of cases. And I'm, I'm sorry, this is I'm, I'm focusing on this. This is like the the best estimate number of cases. Um, we're talking about like nine point um, nine point eight million. The huge reservoir of TB infection, and so this is why it's so important not. Um, not just to wait until people are sick, but think about ways, you know, what our what are our um, preventative programs, what are our identification programs for those at highest risk. Um, for those of who, uh, those of us who like maps that are just looking at the TB incidence rates again in 2020. Um, you know, I, I, again, I don't think this is going to be at all surprising um, for those of us thinking about the, the bands of the world um, with higher incidence rates, um, you know, with the lo largest um, incidence rates in um, sub-Saharan Africa, as, um, as well as Asia, and with the lowest incidence um, rates being the U.S. and Canada um, as countries, um, Western Europe um, and Australia. Um, I will, you know, note that like Greenland, you know, again, you know, when we look at the, the United States and we look at um, different populations, we'll see that um, uh, demographics are, um, are really important. And so Greenland with a large, um, uh, you know, First Nations um, Inuit population has, you know, has, has a higher rate, you know, when we look at the rest of, rest of North America. Um, this is uh, CDC data looking a little bit more locally, looking at the country from 2021. Um, I will say, and of course I pulled this up and I can't pull this up among my screens, but uh, the CDC just released 2022 data um, in advance of the publication tomorrow for World TB Day. Um, and so of course my slides are already out of date, but if we look at that, this, um, this rate is going up. Um, similar percentage of um, uh, U.S. born um, count, non-U.S. born count here. This is the um, U.S. born rate of tuberculosis um, in the U.S. and the non-U.S. born rate. And so we can see that we're seeing similar patterns that um, while being U.S. born is not a... Um, it, 
zero, um, that in terms of identifying those at highest risk, identifying those who are born outside the US definitely increases the risk as we go back to thinking about this and thinking about where the highest incidence rates are of tuberculosis. Um, but uh, I don't need to tell anyone why in 2020 our, our rates decreased, but we are seeing an increase in 2021 and again in 2022, not back to 2019. Um, and obviously there are a number of factors as we think about all of the um, uh, the the things we have to think about in terms of someone's tuberculosis risk, not only where um, you know where they were born, where they've traveled, who they have contact with, um, et, et cetera, all of that decrease in 2020, but also their access to care, you know. Do we have the appropriate programs established in order to identify those at highest risk? And thinking about the huge diversion of already limited um, and understaffed public health programs away from tuberculosis to COVID and how in a lot of places that shift hasn't um, been able to shift all the way back, um, uh, decrease screening. Um, you know, of of um, higher risk individuals has you know led to later identification of active cases, um, which also increases the risk of transmission. Um, so, thinking about you know what are we going to see in the next couple of years, um, definitely some something interesting to think about. Um, I alluded to this before that when we think about the U.S., we can't think about the U.S. as a monolithic country, of course, and thinking about TB incidence rates vary greatly um, among states and, of course, within states. Um, you know, we're going to see even more um, variations. Uh, for those who are interested, I don't have that. I, you know, I have, you know, one can access um, uh uh, city and town level data um, in, in Massachusetts. But if we look here at TB incidence rates, um, looking at uh, states with um, larger uh, larger populations of individuals born outside the US, uh, more likely to have recent immigrants um, and large uh, Native American um, and uh, Asian and Pacific Islander populations as well. And so when we think about, you know, California, New York, Texas, et cetera, it makes sense in terms of migration patterns, um, thinking about recent um, recent immigrants, um, more, um, more individuals born outside the U.S. But then when we think about Alaska and Hawaii, we don't think about those as Alaska, you know, for example, not as a as destination for um, new arrivals to the U.S. But then when we think about um, Native uh, Native American Inuit populations in Alaska increases the risk in Hawaii with um, a, a larger percentage of of Asian um, uh, uh, Asian and Asian American residents as well. Um, this is Massachusetts um, DPH TB data for 2021, um, and I won't belabor all of this. A lot of this is you know for your reference. I'm happy to send slides for those who are interested, um, but acknowledging that 90% um, of you know cases in 2021 were non-US born, just acknowledging like known higher risk groups. Um, Want to call attention as we you know um, start. Uh, transitioning to thinking about children in particular, that the numbers of cases in children are thankfully low, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, um, that you know this is sort of an easy population um, to care for. So just wanted to mention that. Um, Dr. Demer mentioned as well um, something about uh, tuberculosis infecting any part of the body. We think about it as sort of the classic, oh, there's a cough there's a bloody handkerchief, um, you know, someone's wasting away. And yes, pulmonary tuberculosis remains the most common site of um, active disease um, uh, in tuber tuberculosis in Massachusetts. 54% of cases in 2021 were pulmonary, but remembering that extra pulmonary was nearly a third and there's a non-insignificant proportion of, of people with both pulmonary and extra pulmonary disease, again, um, making, you know, making diagnosis um, challenging. Um, just a little bit, you know, I wanted to bring, you know, the, the public health messaging a, a little bit um, into more into the modern era. I love looking at the historical things. There is no focus on expectoration or spitting, as you can see here. Um, but the message is that too many people in the U.S. still suffer from TB. Um, focuses on that reservoir that I talked about. It's 1.7 billion people in 
the world um, who have latent tuberculosis, um, but up to 13 million in the U.S. Um, in 2021, it, 7,800, it was a little over 8,000 um, you know, people in 2022. I mentioned the increase, um, 600 deaths. So again, nowhere near um, you know, a leading cause of death. Um, you know, certainly with COVID, tuberculosis is nowhere close to a leading infectious cause, um, you know, of death in the U.S. But again, um, until 600 people, we're still learning about COVID impacts, et cetera. Um, and this is, you know, geared towards healthcare providers, but really thinking about think, test, and treat. And so, um, you know, my, you know, my teaching, when I talk about pediatric TB is when should you think about it? I'm like, always, um, because of the challenges of diagnosis um, in, in children, um, especially um, recognizing the risk factors and symptoms of TB, not just those classic ones, the bloody handkerchief, the, the wasting away, um, but thinking about how, you know, these could be, um, these presenting symptoms um, and signs can be different in children. Um, <clears throat> testing when appropriate, identifying um, the proper population. I'll talk about that. Like why, you know, why don't we have universal testing um, here in the U.S. and then treatment and support thereof because there are challenges there. Um, remembering again, coming back to that message that TB can happen anywhere and to anyone. Yes, the vast majority of cases are in people born outside the U.S. Again, this changes in, in children because they might not be born in the U.S., but again, because they're more vulnerable, their families might be. So again, um, you know, many of my patients, you know, are U.S. born, um, but that doesn't, um, you know, decrease their risk based on, you know, their community exposures. Um, remembering uh, racial and ethnic disparities and TB diagnoses and looking at this. Um, and I just wanted to highlight this again, um, looking at incidence rates per 100,000 um, population, it's 14.4 um, in Asian and Asian American populations, 18.4 um, in Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islanders, um, American Indian, Alaska Native, 3.5, um, all, you know, all significantly higher than in white Americans. Um, and so just wanna highlight as we think back to the map showing the variability um, among states, um, thinking about that. So thinking about, you know, if you are in healthcare or, you know, in, in some other, you know, public community, you know, work thinking about um, who do you work with? Um, who do you, um, uh, you know, who do you live with? Who needs to be aware of um, TB screening and testing programs as well? Um, and just thinking about, you know, um, programs in terms of, you know, surveillance, getting better diagnostics and treatment options. Um, we saw how, you know, treatment options from the immediate post-World War II era are still the mainstay of, of tuberculosis therapy. Um, when you think about, you um, how many medications um, to treat hypertension and diabetes and you know, other chronic illnesses are there. And we are still using um, many of the same medications for, you know, seven plus decades, you know, at this point. Um, and then it's really supporting, you know, public health infrastructure, et cetera. Um, so transitioning a little bit more in, um, to thinking about um, children, um, this is from 2016, but looking at um, the burden of of uh, TB, um, you know, and the number of TB cases in different regions of the world, um, the total TB incidence in zero to 14, looking at the younger kids, teenagers are often, you know, lumped in, you know, separately or either grouped separately or lumped in, you know, with adults um, uh, for, for various reasons, but it was nearly um, a million cases. So again, a smaller number, but it's still a million cases of pediatric tuberculosis in 2015. Um, when we go back to looking at, um, again, this is data from 2021, um, since the 2022 data was still released, but looking at the breakdown um, by age group, um, you know, we're looking at much smaller ends in younger um, younger age groups. But again, this is not insignificant. This is not a it's very much still a pediatric disease. Something that we need to think about, um, especially because of challenges, because they're not going to present um, as classically as as older, um, as older patients. So why is pediatric TB important? And so I've been alluding to this and hinting, you know, about this and, and why. And so I will come back to, to this point a lot that it's both a personal health and a public health issue. 
in terms of personal health, high, um, there are high rates of morbidity and mortality compared to adults. Um, and we'll go into you know, some of that data before. But a case of tuberculosis in a child is the proverbial proverbial canary in a coal mine, um, that a diagnosis of TB infection or disease, so it doesn't have to be a sick child with TB disease, but even TB infection or, or latent tuberculosis or LTBI in a child is a sentinel public health event because it usually represents recent transmission of TB. That um, you know, child did not get tuberculosis in isolation, no pun intended. That child received, you know, um, uh, was exposed and became infected with tuberculosis due to um, you know his or her community, and that implies um, a, a most likely a recent transmission. So again, um, it's a personal health issue due to risks um, to the child um, itself, but also meaning it, you can't just say, okay, great, let's focus and let's treat this child. We need to learn more about who does the child live with. Um, who's their family, who's their community, um, and really um, thinking broadly, not just thinking about immediate, you know, family units, but thinking about, you know, who else is in that extended family um, in the community, in school, um, places of worship, um, child care centers, et cetera, really thinking about um, where, um, where and when this happened. So thinking about the personal health issue and the risk of progression to TB disease, um, immunocompetent adults um, have a five to 10% lifetime risk of developing disease after infection, um, which is still not insignificant. But if we think about that over decades, five to 10% lifetime risk is not that high. When we think about the subset of adults with TB infection and untreated H, untreated HIV infection, um, it becomes a five to 10% annual risk. So markedly, markedly higher, still, you know, um, still not zero, but still not, um, not a given that um, there will be progression or activation to TB disease. But then we look at children. Um, and this is a slide that I use a lot in my teaching to really emphasize why that even though our numbers of tuberculosis cases in children, um, both in Massachusetts and nationally are very low, why it becomes such a huge issue to make sure we are identifying these children early and identifying children who might be exposed to patients with tuberculosis early when we think about this. Um, and so the risk of disease following primary infection progression from a latent infection to active disease in infants under a year, um, only 50% have a chance of having no disease. So that's a 50% risk of progression to active disease. And we think about even adults with their annual you know, risk, adults with um, untreated HIV, their annual risk is maximum 10%. And that's five times higher in infants. And of those 50%, um, the majority will just have pulmonary tuberculosis, um, which you know, as we've seen is not, um, not insignificant but up to 20% will have disseminated or miliary TB. Um, we saw some slides where this is literally um, everywhere in the lungs, but also you know, widespread since TB can be anywhere, um, or tuberculous meningitis, um, CNS or central nervous system disease um, with a very high rate of not just morbidity, but mortality as well. Um, this is essentially a, you know, a, a a deadly, um, a life-limiting disease if untreated. And when we think about um, how quickly infants can become sick with anything and get sick quickly, um, it becomes really imperative to make sure that we are identifying these children um, correctly and early and appropriately. And then when we think about other age groups, when we think about um, the toddlers, the one to two year olds, um, they are developing their immune systems. They're better able to um, you know, keep their, their latent infections latent. But again, the risk of disseminated or, or CNS disease is still two to 5%, which is still, if we think about it, untreated HIV in adults, five to 10% risk, we're, we're, you know, we're approaching that. And so this is something um, that we need to, um, need to really think about. Then two to five years, again, immune systems are even more maturing. We have a much lower risk, but again, a non-zero risk of, of severe disease. Then we have 
five to 10, you know, 12, you know, um, where we have these safe school years where um, low, much lower risk of progression to active disease. Um, but then when we hit um, puberty and adolescence, we start seeing that, okay, the, the risk of, you know, progression to pulmonary TB actually can be as high as 20%. Um, and uh, adolescents can have more adult type pulmonary disease. And remembering that then that means that they're more likely to be transmitting as well. And so thinking about um, the different ways uh, that children can present across the age spectrum is really important. And, and um, remembering this when that it might be that you might only see, you know, a, a couple of kids where you think about this, but the enormous risks um, if untreated, but in the enormous benefits of appropriate identification and treatment um, um, really need to be remembered. Um, so again, thinking about high risk groups within pediatrics, we think about age, we think about how recent was the infection, um, the highest risk of progression to uh, disease is in the first six months, but it remains high for two years. Um, so if you think about those infants and toddlers, that's their entire life. And so if there was a, um, a recent infection, recent travel, recent pot potential exposure, those are the children who need to be identified now, not five years later, oh yes, you traveled somewhere. Did you have exposure to your grandparent when you know visiting your, you know, your family's country of origin? So recent immigration is also high risk um, as well. Um, and then thinking about immunodeficiency, whether an underlying um, immunodeficiency due to um, uh, but a congenital issue, um, a disease, or iatrogenic because of immunosuppressive drugs as well. So um, so we talked about the personal health issue, high rates of morbidity and mortality, you know, what, you know, causes, you know, raises the, the risk, um, some of which may be, you know, higher in children. Um, but then it's a public health issue because I want to emphasize here that TB infection or disease in a child represents recent transmission of tuberculosis. So it means that we can't just focus on that child. We need to think about, um, you know, their family and, um, and, uh, and community as well, and really thinking about the the role of the the content investigation, um, you know, being creative, not just saying, okay, great, we've talked, you know, the parents, the siblings, et cetera, but thinking about, you know, for example, you know, here, you know, here in in, in Boston, Massachusetts, Boston and Massachusetts, we have triple deckers, and often those triple deckers have, you know, extended family members. So it's not just to say what's the address, you know, number one Main Street, apartment one on the ground floor, but thinking about who lives on the second floor, who lives on the third floor, or you know these part of, you know, are, you know, are these members of a child's family? Are these also people we need to investigate? A child might not work, but a child is in the daycare center. Um, you know, was it someone there? You know, are there informal daycare centers that, you know, um, you know, haven't investigated um, other community settings? Who visited the child, um, not just from the local community, but who visited the child from, you know, outside um, the country? Did that relative you know, maybe visit other, you know, extended family members, live in other households, et cetera. Maybe that, you know, relative lived with another family member for their visit, um, you know, to the area, but then came and spent every weekend, you know, with the child's family. So really thinking about um, when and where and how this could have happened. Um, and and we'll, we'll come back to this as well. Um, I want to pause a little bit before we think about diagnostic challenges, think about some preventative issues and the role of the BCG vaccine, which Dr. DeMaria um, talked about as well. Um, this map is from the World Atlas of BCG Policies and Practices. Um, and you know, there's, there's, there's a lot, there's, you know, some, you know, very small, um, a small print here, but looking at how most of the world has a current national BCG program for all. So this is like the, the sort of seafoam green color, um, at least on my screen, um, covering, you know, most of the world. Um, and there's some countries with past um, national um, policies for all. We can see, um, you know, some in Eastern Europe, um, in Syria as well, as well as Ireland. Um, and then there's current, um, you know, uh, then there's some countries that had past vaccinations with current vaccination for special groups. And that's like um, most of um, most of Western Europe, as well as um, the, the Czech Republic. Um, 
and uh, and Australia and New Zealand here and, and Canada. And then current BCG vaccination is, is here, um, Italy and, and the US. And so we think about this, like, why is this so different? Um, you know, we've talked about how much of the world, um, you know, has high incidence rates of tuberculosis, um, you know, it makes sense lower, um, you know, lower incidence countries don't, um, uh, you know, don't need BCG vaccine. But why is that? Like, why, you know, if it works, why not, um, you know, give this universally? Why has there been a switch to not, um, you know, not giving BCG vaccine to everyone with low incidence rates? This is very different. If you think about it, if we step back and think, you know, outside tuberculosis, um, Polio um, was declared um, eliminated in the Western Hemisphere, you know, over um, two decades ago. We still very much, you know, do polio vaccination, um, you know, in the U.S. And this is notwithstanding polio being found in water supplies in New York, et cetera, even due to the case. But regardless, polio has not been knock on wood, reestablished. Um, measles, you know, um, you know, vaccine um, as part of the MMR is absolutely part of the routine, you know, immunization practices, even though um, measles has been declared eliminated in the US, um, you know, for, for over a couple of decades. But why is BCG vaccine not, you know, why was that removed? Why was a universal neonatal vaccine removed, um, you know, from the vaccination recommendations in most countries? And it's, it's, it's a really interesting public health um, anomaly when we think about this, because it's, it's really an exception where it wasn't that a vaccine was found to be unsafe. It wasn't found to be, you know, ineffective. It was really more because of, um, in, in a public setting, you know, milieu that, you um, uh, it wasn't it wasn't found to be effective. So BCG vaccine, there are many different formulations around the world. The most common ones are Denmark, Japan, and Russia, BCG. Um, but it's not given in the US. As you can see, there's availability for research, bladder cancer, very specific populations when someone is considered truly at risk with ongoing exposures and for some reason cannot, you know, um, you know, receive, you know, treatment, et cetera. But remembering that it's a neonatal vaccine, um, if you look at immunization records from around the world, it's typically given within a couple of days, you know, of um, of birth, and it's because it prevents severe miliary and CNS um, TB disease in the first year or so of life, and that's what it's really good for. Um, BCG vaccine, like I said, different formulations, but basically BCG vaccine um, has been unchanged um, in terms of its, you know, core. Um, core formulation in its role um, for over a hundred years. And if we think about this, like how many versions of the COVID vaccine we've seen in just a couple of years, we're stuck with the BCG vaccine for over a century. Um, and it's good for this limited purpose in terms of decreasing rates of neonatal disease, which is very important as we saw that there are huge, you know, there's a huge personal health risk um, in infants for more severe disease and that it, it works. But it, that's where it really works. It, you know, there's possible reduced mortality from other infectious causes. Um, there's, you know, more research, um, you know, going into that in terms of overall, you know, all cause mortality. But there's variable impact on TB infection. And then there's issues with interpretation of tests as well, making it not useful in lower incidence, you know, countries. So in terms of, um, I'm going to switch to TB disease and then kind of come back and, and, and think about like what we do in terms of TB screening um, and, you know, and testing and treatment overall, but thinking about these pediatric diagnostic challenges. Um, so across the age spectrum, children are going to act differently and present differently from adults with tuberculosis and from one another. Um, they may be asymptomatic for a while before they crash and become really sick, they might have nonspecific symptoms. Um, they might have fever, they might not have weight loss per se, but there might be poor weight gain, it might be poor appetite, which of course can be nonspecific and can be caused by any number of things. Um, we talked about, um, you know, extra pulmonary disease, but you know, up to a third of disease in children can be extra pulmonary outside the lung. Um, so it becomes really important, not just to focus on, does a child have um, respiratory breathing symptoms, um, knowing that they might be asymptomatic, but the, the TB might be elsewhere. Um, 
you know, I talked about meningitis, miliary widespread disease, um, you know, happening soon after infection. Um, so there should be lower thresholds for not just getting the x-rays, which is the mainstay of ruling out tuberculosis in, in older patients. Um, and I say older patients, not meaning older adults, older patients to me is anyone over, you know, in their 20s, that's an older patient to me. But in, in, in the youngest children, having a low threshold for a lumbar puncture, an LP, an eye evaluation, other imaging, thinking about where else TB could be. Um, and remembering that a child with tuberculosis might have a completely normal physical examination. Other diagnostic challenges, and sorry that the print is, is, is quite small here, is that um, the screening tools that we have, getting the tuberculin skin test, the TST or PPD, um, per, um, purified protein derivative, or the interferon gamma release assay, which is the blood test. Um, again, these look for immune responses to tuberculosis, identify infection. They don't distinguish between infection and disease, but they may be negative early in disease. Um, there are many chest x-ray challenges. Um, I've asterisked that because I'm going to go through um, x-rays, you know, really quickly, but just to give you a flavor of like why we're challenged with this. Um, but a chest x-ray alone might not be enough. We, we need to get a low threshold for a chest CT um, to get a better look at subtle findings, looking for lymphadenopathy, um, and remembering that in younger children who might not have actual confirmatory data, we might only be able to look at imaging um, to look um, to be able to follow um, and see how they're responding. And it's also really important, again, when we look at a child, we never look at the child alone. We need to look, you know, think about their family, um, think about is there an identified adult source case? Um, because if we don't have any, you know, absolute 100% confirmatory data in a child, we need to think about, well, is there confirmation that the source case had tuberculosis or is there micro data, you know, from that, um, you know, from that uh, adult that we can follow as well. And basically, um, you know, I, I, I come to the term, be a retrospective detective. It's all about not just looking at the child right now, because that child might look fine. I have treated dozens of children with active tuberculosis who look fine. But then we have to be retrospective and say, like, where, you know, where did they come? You know, where were they born? Where have they been? Who have they been in contact with? And we're like, let's, there are enough data points here that, you know, the index of suspicion becomes high. So as I mentioned, I want to go through some chest x-rays rapidly um, and, you know, think about, and I'm just focusing on chest x-rays to keep it simple, not looking at CTs, but just thinking about, you know, in our teenagers who are going to present a little bit more familiar, familiarly, um, you know, we start, um, you know, start seeing more cavitary, you know, we, we do start seeing cavitary disease. This is a, a, a child who had bilateral, you know, pulmonary, um, pulmonary disease, um, cavitary disease. And we're like, okay, this is frankly abnormal. There, there's something going on. We need to think about, you know, tuberculosis. Um, and as we get younger and younger, you know, we're here, I will say this is a 10 year old who did not have tuberculosis, because again, a 10 year old, um, there were demographic, you know, features here that made this child lower risk had never traveled outside the US, um, didn't have any you know, concerning exposures. Um, and is in that age group, you know, like I mentioned, that sort of safe school year period, um, but who looked like you know, tuberculosis, we had to think about it, but then we were able to more quickly, you know, remove it. Um, but then we start thinking about the looking at younger children who um, might look really like there's something abnormal, but does this have to be tuberculosis? We don't know. Um, and then, you know, as we get younger, there's certainly abnormalities, you know, in this chest x-ray. We're not seeing the cavitations. We're not seeing the, the classic findings that we think about, you know, with um, the calcifications, you know, et cetera. And then, we, you know, in the babies, we're like, Yes, there's something going on, but how can this be tuberculosis? This one has very helpful arrows in there, um, as well on the original um, original film. But just wanted to highlight that um, radiographically, it's not simple. Like, okay, great, yeah, this doesn't look like TB. Looking like TB in a child can really look like anything. Then there's the mycobacteriologic diagnosis of tuberculosis. Again, coming back to that standard, oh, the the, the bloody cough, the bloody handkerchief. Um, in adults with pulmonary disease, you know, up to 90% will have a sputum um, when they cough up, um, not spit up, but coughed up, um, that's positive for mycobacterium tuberculosis. 
But children tend to have what we call posse bacillary disease, where they don't have that many um, tubercles. They don't have as many bacteria. You can't obtain sputum from a younger child. It's great because they're not going to be as contagious to others, but you can't obtain sputum. So we get gastric aspirates. A nasogastric tube is put through the nose, into the stomach. Um, you get early morning aspirates, the idea that... Um, there's, you know, with tuberculosis, they're coughing up a little bit, most likely swallowing it at night when they're recumbent, when they're lying down. Um, and then in the morning, there might be higher yields. But again, we see that um, the, the yield is, um, is much lower than with sputum in adults. Um, I have had positive gastric aspirates. I've had many children, we get gastric aspirates, they're, they're all negative. Um, but we, you know, we, we end up treating for presumptive TB. Um, other, you know, specimens might be done, but um, getting a, a bronchoscopy and getting washings from the lung. Um, so a more invasive procedure, the sensitivity may be less and it's not something we, we do. So again, sort of the standard, you know, diagnosis, you know, um, protocol for adults really doesn't hold true for children making more difficult. And as you can see here, uh, for those who are familiar with, you know, adult TB care, um, I'm always surprised at this, but adults are, you know, sometimes diagnosed and start treatment um, as outpatients. Children have to be admitted to get gastric aspirates and get, you know, get this whole process started. Um, you know, it, it, you know, my first bullet point there, um, we need to think about where can they come in? You know, not all, you know, settings might have the negative pressure rooms we need um, to be able to do this. Um, and again, it's not just thinking about the child. We need to think about family screening. Um, a child is rarely admitted, you know, alone. There are going to be parents and family members. So think about visitation. Like if we haven't identified a source case, who are the family members coming in can they be tested, um, you know, ASAP, um, and always thinking about HIV testing as well, um, making sure that there has been HIV testing um, during, you know, pregnancy, you know, for mom, but if not, just confirming that there is HIV testing, because that's obviously going to change um, as well. Um, kind of moving from the, the youngest kids, but thinking about adolescents, I just wanted to comment on the challenges of um, uh, uh, TB diagnosis when people aren't thinking about tuberculosis and especially during the pandemic are thinking about other respiratory diseases. Um, I won't go through this in, in detail, but just two adolescent patients um, that we had who um, this first one had, you can see many visits to her PCP and emergency departments. Um, some were virtual visits, you know, was treated um, with this, was even sent home from um, an emergency department with hemoptysis because she was COVID negative and was just started on, on um, bacteria antibacterial therapy, then was admitted and was admitted for two months um, because she had very severe tuberculosis, had malnutrition, was under absorbing her medications, um, had, had two months where she was stuck in a room at the hospital, unable to go home, um, unable to you know, participate, well, in, in virtual schooling from home, we'll say. She was un unwilling to participate in virtual school from the hospital. Then we have another teenager who was treated multiple times in 2020 for, um, for community-acquired pneumonia and then was diagnosed with COVID. And his very concerning um, history, um, you know, of um, uh, his mother being treated for tuberculosis during her pregnancy with him was completely un, you know, unremarked on as the focus was on his, oh, you don't have COVID. Um, and then he was in, ended up becoming admitted twice because again, he had issues with a prolonged course of untreated tuberculosis with um, uh, malnourishment um, under absorption of medications, ended up getting admitted twice before, before being treat, treated. They both did remarkably well. Um, but as you can see, that was huge burdens in terms of admissions, um, a more complicated course um, due to the difficulty in diagnoses, which may not just be TB itself, but other, um, other things as well. In the interest of time, I'll go through this, you know, next part, you know, very quickly, but um, I've talked about this, like, why not routine universal mandated TB testing here in the U.S.? Um, why is it, you know, focused on, you know, certain settings, et cetera? Um, and it's because it's an inefficient use of healthcare care resources, um, we would be testing a large number of low risk children um, and testing in low prevalence groups would result in mostly false positive testing, even if we had a test that had a 99% specificity rate. Um, we Our blood tests, the Igor's inner 
um, interferon gamma release assays are better um, than the skin test, but it still does not eliminate the risk of false positives in a low risk population. And so therefore you do targeted TB testing, doing a risk assessment, thinking about what are all the risk factors that we've talked about. Um, if there's at least one um, you know, that's identified, whether it's a general pediatric practice, I also you know, work as a primary care pediatrician or I'm in a school-based healthcare, and then thinking about um, you know, who needs testing. This risk assessment might happen through contact and source case investigations. Obviously, in someone with signs and symptoms consistent with TB, remembering that those might be very varied in children. And also um, children with high risk of progression due to underlying conditions, those with HIV, taking immunosuppressive or immunomodulatory therapy as well. So we ask questions, you know, about um, family members, travel, residents, um, you know, et cetera. Um, but remembering that screening might bring in more people. And then we ask more questions and they're like, oh, the family member with TB disease was mom when she was 20 years old, 10 years before the child was born. That's great, you know, whatever. But again, we've identified, um, you know, more people than we might ultimately, you know, get tested. I won't belabor this, but this is the algorithm for TB, um, you know, screening, thinking about age, um, you know, risk, uh, once risk factors are identified, age, um, you know, other factors in terms of, you know, pros and cons of our tests in, in children, um, the skin test versus, you know, versus the blood test, um, and it goes through our thing, um, you know, step-by-step -step recommendations. And in terms of TB infection, um, you know, these are the recommendations. We have multiple options, um, complicated, you know, by, uh, you know, um, a, a number of different things. But again, um, you know, many months in pediatric TB infection or disease, when we're thinking about treatment, it's such a coordinated interdisciplinary public health endeavor. There is the, you know, MD or TB provider, there are nurses from Department of Public Health, the local board of health, there's a primary care team that might also be, a, you know, a point of contact. There's a school nurse or team, you know, for, you know, older children um, who are attending school, getting care there, and the family who is administering medications, you know, if DOT is, is not um, a relevant, you know, issue for uh, TB infection or on weekends, um, but who might also be going through treatment themselves, you know, in, in, in terms of pediatric you know, TB, you know, this it, it's likely not just one child, you know, who's getting treated. And so there's like such an enormous public health endeavor that lasts for many months. And then treatment, um, there are a lot of medication challenges, um, you know, in terms of supply, you know, supply issues, which, you know, we're, we're dealing with currently, we have to think about are the formulations and the correct dosages that might patient needs actually available, um, even if there's not a global supply issue, administration, I mean, this could be a separate talk in and of itself, all the different strategies we use to get children to, to take their medications, um, the need for directly observed therapy, where is that going to happen, um, and the long course, the need for monitoring as well. Um, you know, the family community evaluation Remember, the contact investigation can go both ways. A child might be picked up in, you know, a school setting because someone decided like, oh, we're going to identify, you know, children who are higher risk. And that identifies, wait, this child's positive. Could there be someone else in the family or larger community to be identified or the child is identified as a contact of an adult case? Um, and there's special consideration to think about, you know, in terms of pregnancy, breastfeeding, window prophylaxis for the highest risk age groups when they are contacts, even if they're well, their testing is negative, their test exit is negative. We start preventative treatment because they might already have, um, you know, be become infected. We're just not identifying them. And we know that they're at the highest risk for progressing to, to active disease. Um, so in terms of take home points, um, just wanted to go back to thinking about which age groups um, have the highest TB case rates, infants and post-pubertal post adolescents, that children are usually infected by adults or adolescent household contacts, or maybe in the community, but they're not infectious or contagious to others because they have lower numbers of bacteria, that infection or disease in a child is a sentinel public health event. Um, TB control in the U.S. involves targeted testing, contact investigations, sort of, you know, evaluation, you know, in a stepwise fashion, as we talked about, and the importance of identification and treatment um, to reduce future disease, decreasing that reservoir of people who are going to represent both personal and public health emergencies. Um, and so always have a high index of suspicion of, for TB in children, remembering those diagnostic challenges and remembering the treatment challenges in children as well. 
so I think we can switch to um, questions. I just wanted to put my email address here. If people had any questions, like I said, I'm happy to happy to send my slides as well. Thank you. Uh, and we, we do have some questions in the chat. I, I just want to clarify one thing that um, that that the difference in severity uh, and uh, consequences of infection risk for progression in infants uh, and the uh, increased risk for progression in, in uh, teenagers was the same back in the time I was mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And the Sentinel event was was applicable then. I, um, and I, I should have pointed that out. The other thing is the reason why children were dressed or undressed the way they were is part of the treatment was sun exposure. Right. That, uh, and, and I was once again talking faster than I was thinking um, that those kids were getting more sun. And, and we now know that that promotes vitamin D levels and that may have been part of it. So the, the first question was, once children or adults were admitted to sanitaria, uh, what was the, when, when could they be discharged? And it was basically when, when they had active disease, if they uh, essentially improved to the extent that they weren't coughing very much anymore, and that they had what was called arrested because they recognized they weren't, they weren't really better. They were just had arrested active disease. Once their disease was arrested by the healthy conditions and good diet, they could then leave the sanatorium. Uh, and then there's another question about uh, why is it taking so long to develop the vaccine for TB? And I'll, I'll have Dr. Madhavan answer that one. Um, that that's sort of the, the million dollar or billions of dollar question. You know, um, you know, I can say um, I think that the short answer is that, um, you know, given that this is not, you know, um, you know, I didn't go into the pathophysiology and the immune responses to tuberculosis, but it's not a straightforward, you know, pathway. It's not like someone is exposed to, um, you know, chicken pox. There's a very clear, you know, pathway, like here's the incubation period. This is when someone who is non-immune to um, varicella or chicken pox will then, you know, get sick. This is the, you know, this is a straightforward pattern The you know, the majority of people will be able to, um, you know, cap capture and sort of control tuberculosis. It becomes dormant, it becomes latent. Um, some people will activate, it, it's, it's a much more complicated, um, you know, pathway. Um, and so it, it's not as, as easy to say like, oh, here is the, the vaccine. This is the target. This is going to induce an immune response that will, you know, uh, prevent tuberculosis because again, the body's immune response works in the, in the majority of cases. Um, so that's a very sort of high level, you know, answer in terms of the complexity of um, trying to d develop a TB vaccine that, um, that actually works um, and works long-term because again, you don't necessarily want it to, to prevent, you know, sort of, if you're exposed, you want to prevent TB, you know, infection that actually, happens, you know, in most, you know, in, in, in most cases or prevent TB disease, it's more about that, you know, the, the longer term, the, the longer term, how do you actually prevent your immune system from, uh, from sort of uh, reacting well enough that it becomes latent? Um, how, how do you actually like clear it, you know, eventually, if, if that sort of makes sense? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to keep this at a, at a very general level. Uh, and uh, another question about uh, are immigrants to the U.S. tested before arrival? Yes, indeed, they are, and they get classified in various ways for public health follow-up when they arrive. So TB is uh, one of the uh, screens for people coming to the U.S. And I just want to build on that. So um, if there's a concern for, you know, active tuberculosis, that's, you know, if there's, jump, you know, people jump on that quickly, but TB infection, um, there's no requirement for treatment of said TB infection. Um, and this is often true. This is even true, you know, not, you know, in, in the U.S. that there might be a requirement for TB testing for a new employee in a healthcare system or, you know, pre-university testing but there's no requirement for follow-up treatment. Um, and so I'm often seeing kids, you know, you know, years later, I'm like, 
wait, they've had a positive test four years ago. How come this never got, you know, followed through? And then, you know, we're seeing them much later. Um, so, so that pairing of, you know, the, the, the full thing, we've been like think TB, test TB, but also treat TB, that treat TB is sometimes not always followed through, um, you know, in the, in the um, immigration process. And then there's a question about the word consumptive. So, um, consumptive, we, before TB was recognized to be an infectious disease, uh, it, 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 as, as I've said, there was a virus, there was a lot of different theories about what caused TB. The two main ones were um, hereditary and environmental, but basically people presented with a cough and wasting, and they wasted away. They were consumed by the illness. Uh, and so they were called having consumption. If you look at the death certificates from the period between 1842 and the 1890s, uh, people dying of TB were dying of consumption. That was the technical mm -hmm. term for tuberculosis. Uh, even though the tubercle was described um, before 1850, uh, the, the pathologic representation of what was going on in the body, the, the tubercle, the tuberculosis is named after, was recognized. The significance of that observation wasn't made. So consumption is what it was. Um, and, and people might have heard the term galloping consumption as well for really rapidly progressing um, disease. Um, but my my assumption has always been that was more likely to be miliary disease or multifocal tuberculosis um, or some underlying um, disease that was making someone even more prone to um, rapid worsening. But galloping consumption was really um, referencing the rapidity of someone's decline. And then there's a comment about not all immigrants are tested before arrival, and and uh, you know I think there's a there's a, uh, a terminology here. So. Anyone who's applying to be an immigrant gets tested and uh, people enter on other kinds of visas and in other ways uh, and perhaps are not tested. And, and sometimes that's an issue, for example, with students. And you might want to comment on that. Students coming from other countries uh, need to be screened for TB with a skin test or IGRA, but sometimes that doesn't happen. Um, Another, oh, and then there's a question about the impact of BCG um, on uh, diagnosis. And there's some readings of those who migrate to the US after being vaccinated with BCG, what is the percent who are diagnosed with active TB? Um, that's an excellent question. I don't know if I've seen that specific data. I mean, we can see that we can sort of look at Immigrants knowing that most countries have universal BCG programs, but again, not, you know, that's universal recommendations. Not everyone's going to be um, post remembering that um, while a lot of people will have a scar, it's usually on the, the left arm, which I point there. That's with where I always first look to look for the scar. Not everyone will develop a scar. So if there are not, if we don't have records, um, and a lot of people don't, you know, are not going to have immunization records and they don't have a scar, you know, we don't know their actual BCG status. We can only assume. Um, and I mean, it, 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 I, I don't know if we can get like a true denominator there, but I will say that Yes, I mean, I, I definitely have taken care of children. Um, so this isn't like, oh, the BCG protection waned decades later. I have absolutely taken care of children who have um, have received BCG, you know, vaccine in um, in their home countries and then have um, have active tuberculosis. No, you know, yes, they did not get CNS disease or malaria disease as an infant, but they absolutely had, you know, um, active TB um, within the first two decades of life. Yeah, and I think it must be we see a lot of people who got BCG and get TB, and we, we try to make a point of that so that people don't yes. rule out tuberculosis because people got BCG. But if you think of a country, you know, a country with a large number of people who come to the United States and a proportion of them have TB and there's universal vaccination in that country, obviously people are getting TB despite, we just can't calculate. And uh, correlation between long COVID and TB, I don't think 
Uh, I don't think we know because we haven't enough time to, right. to observe that, but um, it's conceivable they're interacting. Certainly in 19, 19, 19, 20, the, the rate of mortality related, the, the fatality rate with tuberculosis went up after mm -hmm. the pandemic of 1918. Right. So anything is possible here, but we have such a low rate of TB now, it would be hard to. Right. I mean, we can anecdotally say that their patients, you know, I, I hear about from, you know, um, you know, uh, from colleagues in the TB world that, you know, adults are presenting later, you know, because of, you know, delayed screening, delayed presentations to care, et cetera. But I think, again, the overall N is so low that I, I think trying to track patterns right now um, in year three to four is, is going to be hard. Yeah. And then I, I, there's a comment about uh, screening. Uh, for a green card, and uh, you know, and again, it gets to that there are different different ways people come into the country, different visa status, mm -hmm. uh, different levels of of penetration of screening. So uh, that is all all the case, and certain occupations get screened um, regularly because of ongoing exposure. And and uh, I think we need to finish with this, but B, is BCG a one time dose or a series? And depends on where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. In some countries, people get BCG very frequently. In some countries, they get the recommended. That, that BCG World Atlas like has more yeah. details and just that map of um, sort of BCG policies um, country to country. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Madhavan. This was great. And uh, we're getting a lot of positive feedback in the chat as well. Uh, and uh, and uh, Another event that is being sponsored by the Public Health Museum is, is the book club. And the book club uh, this time is reading Perry Class's book, uh, A Good Time to Be Born. Uh, it actually has a different uh, title in paperback, but it's Perry Class's book from 2021. And, and it's all about children uh, and children's health and maternal and child health. Uh, and and all of the things that we've been talking tonight beyond tuberculosis that affected children in the 19th century and the, and the movements in the early 20th century to address the, the, the childhood mortality rate. So, and it's really a wonderful book and I, I would recommend reading it. And if you do read it, please join us for the book club, which you can register for at the uh, Public Health Museum website. All right, thank you all for joining us uh, and uh, we'll, we'll see you at the next program. And thanks once again, Dr. Malabai. Oh, thank you so much for having me tonight. Bye-bye.